What's up, guys? Derek, moreplatesmoredates.com. Today, we're going to be talking about Osterine, also known as MK2866 and Inobosarm. So, we're going to be going over everything there is to know about it, complete overview, top to bottom. Osterine is the most well known and extensively studied selective androgen receptor modulator right now. Uh, it's categorized as a SARM because of its unique selectivity at the androgen receptor where it exhibits a significant amount of anabolic activity in the body relative to androgenic activity. So it's being researched to determine if it's a potential treatment for the management of muscle and bone wasting diseases. Basically, I'm going to talk somewhat briefly, it's going to be pretty elaborate actually, about its potential therapeutic applications. Uh, side effects, anecdotal findings based on my own personal research, etc. So what is it exactly? Um, it's also known as the Nobosarm, GTX-024, and MK2866. So it's a SARM, and SARMs like Osterine stimulate androgen receptors in a selective way, whereby they induce a significantly greater amount of anabolic activity in the body relative to the androgenic activity. So that's sort of where you know, you define something as a SARM as its selective action at the androgen receptor and the way it activates it and, you know, induces and transcribes its effects. Testosterone was, just to give it a bit of background on, you know, the conception of SARMs, testosterone was the first anabolic androgen to be approved for use in a clinical setting. However, its scope of versatility has always been severely limited by its androgenicity and its pharmacokinetic issues so most notable being its lack of selectivity for muscle tissue to other androgen affected tissues like the prostate and also not being bio orally bioavailable so testosterone has a two to one selectivity for muscle to prostate and this lack of selectivity essentially disqualifies it entirely in a clinical setting for treating women as well as men in many scenarios due to the significant amount of Androgenic activity that would occur at a systemic level during the attempted management of muscle or bone wasting diseases. So this is where, you know, the therapeutic promise of SARMs kind of comes into place and uh, shows itself as a viable, a potentially viable alternative. So the ideal anabolic agent for, you know, the management of these diseases would demonstrate anabolic selectivity in muscle and bone without suppressing luteinizing hormone, not negatively interacting with other steroid receptors in the body, exhibit a high level of oral bioavailability without the need for methylation and avoid 5-alpha reduction to DHT and aromatization into estrogen. So obviously that's, you know, like a tall bill to fill. So <laughs> SARMs were first discovered in 1998. And when I say that, that doesn't mean that SARMs fit that specifically. They just are the closest thing to fitting that ideal anabolic description as of as of now so SARMs were first discovered in 1998 following which several different compounds were developed by a, a variety of pharmaceutical companies in order to find a viable compound to satisfy the you know obvious need for mitigating degenerative muscle and you know bone disease treatments so Austrian's mechanism of action uh, by Exhibiting such favorable selectivity for stimulating increases in muscle tissue and strength relative to energetic activity in affected tissues, Austrian has the potential advantage that it could be used at relatively low dosages. It's orally bioavailable, could potentially circumvent some of the negative effects that stem from traditionally used anabolic steroids, converting to 5-alpha reduced androgens in modern medicine that may raise the risk of benign prostate hyperplasia. Um, accelerate the development of prostate carcinoma, increase the probability of acne breakouts, exacerbate, substantially expedite androgenic alopecia, male pattern baldness, etc. Um, it could also potentially eliminate the incidence of androgenic side effects in women entirely, while still potentially inducing enough anabolic activity to offset any uh, muscle or bone loss occurring from degenerative disease. So while this is very beneficial for both men and women, its lack of androgenicity in women makes this very promising for females. Even minor amounts of androgens can cause viralization, making it extremely difficult to find compounds that are potent enough to offset 
uh, musculoskeletal degenerative diseases with no side effects in women. Not only does Austrian increase muscle mass and strength, it increases tendon strength, ligament health, bone, de bone density, and encourages collagen turnover. Has good bioavailability orally, like I mentioned, and this makes oral dosing viable as opposed to, you know, traditional anabolics, you know, have require intramuscular injections with, which is obviously less practical. And uh, the adherence to that would be extremely low among patients likely. And then, you know, the only other option is oral dosing with methylated anabolic steroids that are liver toxic and require a methyl or ethyl group at the C17 alpha position to be orally bioavailable. And Austrian was the closest SARM to making it through through clinical trials and being approved. So as far as the pipeline right now of where it's at, you can see it's, uh, well, let's see, it was the first drug, let's go from the beginning, it was the first drug to be put on the FDA's fast track development program to become an approved drug for the prevention and treatment of muscle wasting diseases in uh, or muscle wasting in patients with cancer in mid-2013, GTX announced that Austrian had failed its late-stage phase three trials as a lung cancer drug intended to prevent muscle wasting. Um, in these trials, 325 patients were given three milligrams of Austrian per day or placebo randomized trial uh, to assess if Austrian would significantly prevent muscle loss in those who received the three milligram dosage versus those who didn't. Power during a stair climb test was used as a measure to assess improvement in physical function and secondary endpoints included an assessment of um, just quality of life. Did the patient feel like their quality of life had improved? If they required less healthcare resources than the placebo group? Um, the trial was deemed a failure, but the positive takeaway was that Austrian demonstrated significant quantitative advantage in lean body mass compared to placebo in both trials. So in layman's terms, Austrian on average increased or maintained a significantly greater muscle mass in the patients treated with it relative to those on the placebo. So following that in 2016, GTX started a phase two clinical trial to assess Austrian's viability as a stress urinary incontinence treatment for women. The results of that did not achieve statistical significance. Looking at the results of Austrian in totality across all of its clinical trials, we can make a more educated assessment on its viability for the purposes of selective increases in muscle mass relative to androgenic activity. Um, it's been evaluated in 27 completed or ongoing clinical trials. About 1,500 subjects in total have been treated with Austrian in some capacity, dosages ranging from as low as 0.1 milligrams all the way up to 100 milligrams per day. Austrian was observed to be generally safe and well tolerated in all of those trials. One notable one, it was a phase two trial and it evaluated Austrian as a form of hormonal therapy for women with estrogen receptor positive and androgen receptor positive breast cancer and it was broken down into two dose co cohorts with one group getting nine milligrams daily and the other getting 18 milligrams daily the phase two trial pre-specified threshold for success clinical benefit response was attained meeting the trial's primary efficacy stand uh endpoint um the trial enrolled the predefined number of valuable uh Patients in both dosage arms with at least 44 patients in each of the two cohorts receiving 9 milligrams or 18 milligrams of the daily doses of Austrian respectively. It represented or presented the first opportunity for us to kind of gather clinical data representing what results would occur with what is generally considered to be, you know, like high Austrian dosages. So obviously in the context of the recreational bodybuilding community to them a high dose of austrian is like you know well i guess it's kind of like up for debate and it's perspective related but you know th the studies that people look usually look at are you know the low like one two milligram studies but a lot of people don't realize there's these studies with nine milligrams and 18 milligrams in women and interesting stuff as far as uh getting onwards to kind of comparisons to steroids themselves. So is Austrian as strong as steroids? Um, you can pull up a graph here of Austrian versus Nandrolone, milligram for milligram. Austrian is multiple times more effective at increasing lean muscle mass than Nandrolone, a very commonly used 
anabolic androgenic steroid, like I'm sure you've heard of, uh, DECA, even though that's just nandrolone with a decanoate ester, or NPP and nandrolone with the phenylpropanate ester. So nandrolone is the drug itself. And in this study comparing, uh, let's see, nandrolone versus a myostatin antibody and comparing it to Osterine in men and women over 60 years old with hip fractures, Osterine outperformed both the nandrolone and the myostatin antibody. But you have to consider this is milligram for milligram. So yes, while Osterine is stronger milligram for milligram than nandrolone, the point of diminishing returns is likely different in terms of androgen receptor activation, myostatin increasing, uh, relative to you know the compound itself, binding affinity, etc. There's a lot of things that come into play here. You can't just say on paper, oh, Austrian's you know better than nandrolone, like milligram for milligram. If you take 10 milligrams of Austrian versus 10 milligrams of nandrolone in a research subject per day, you know what's going to equate to a greater uh, lean body mass accrual? It's probably going to be the Austrian. But then once you get to dosages significantly higher than that there's very likely a point of diminishing returns where nandrolone is going to start edging it out but as far as this study in particular it's worth noting that that was a result as far as how austrian stacks up to lgd 4033 austrian obviously has you know very favorable selectivity for muscle tissue to prostate and other androgen affected tissues in comparison to LGD 4033, it, it's outperformed in almost all aspects though. In milligram for milligram, LGD 4033, also known as a VK5211 in official trials, outperforms Austrian with greater increases in lean muscle mass and strength, um, despite uh, ligandrol, it's another name for it, being more potent. Austrian is less suppressive, which would make recovering natural testosterone levels a smoother and quicker process after discontinuation, which is you know, likely some sort of, you know, safety measure that will be considered if these compounds ever make it to clinical application, especially in men who, you know, have to experience uh, symptoms of hypogonadism just to run these things potentially, you know, that's going to be a big factor. As far as uh, one common misconception, Austrian is commonly mistaken as S1, but it should be noted that S1, um, also known as C6, was one of the earliest SARMs developed and is far weaker than Austrian. It's not the same compound at all. It's not the same SARM. So just something to keep in mind because a lot of guys get that confused. As far as dosages, predictably, Austrian caught the attention of the bodybuilding industry with, you know, its preclinical profile, blatant potential advantages in a performance-enhancing context. I'm just going to be talking about it from a clinical standpoint because, you know, it's YouTube. I don't want to... Uh, derail the topic too much and it's insightful as it is so austrian was initially trialed at 0 0.1 milligrams 0 0.3 milligrams 1 milligram and 3 milligrams per day it's not well known like i mentioned it was also trialed at 9 and 18 milligrams and was generally well tolerated by women in that less commonly known phase 2 trial um side effects noted in the clinical trials um decreased good cholesterol that is a given with any anabolic. The clinical data on this is inconsistent as there are some studies that show reductions in serum lipids, namely HDL and LDL, occurring in a dose-dependent manner with Austrian usage, as well as data showing only reductions in HDL levels, otherwise known as you know, good cholesterol. We at least know for sure that Austrian has a negative effect on HDL, which is notable as this is a common side effect of all traditional anabolic steroids and other SARMs. Despite SARMs ability to avoid significant energetic activity in the body, they evidently do not differ very much from anabolic steroids in their effects on lipid profiles, which should be noted because it's often overlooked and, you know, blood work isn't overly analyzed a lot in this community and the therapeutic context of the compound and its clinical data is very insightful if you actually dig into it. Testosterone suppression. SARMs have shown to suppress luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone through the HPTA, decreasing test in a dose dependent manner. Regardless of the SARM, Austrian has shown to significantly lower uh, sex hormone binding globulin and serum testosterone. Total testosterone levels in 
clinical trials in subjects treated with one milligram of Austrian or higher, while SHBG was always significantly impacted at notable dosages, suppression of LH and FSH wasn't consistently proven through Austrian's clinical trials. However, after referencing anecdotal logs of baseline pre-Austrian blood work compared to mid-Austrian blood work with dosages several times higher than the 0.1 milligram, 0.3 milligram, 1 milligram, 3 milligram dosages used in trials. Users, you know, commonly use upwards of 25 milligrams in a recreational context. I would assert that it's safe to say that Austrian does show blatant reductions in all of these hormones in a dose dependent manner. And the dosages in the studies just weren't high enough to yield this data. And even though it apparently there's studies upwards of 100 milligrams, this data isn't, um, Either it was done, you know, in a context where this marker wasn't looked at or evaluated exclusively, or it just wasn't published because some of the data is accessible, some of it isn't. But I think it's very safe to say that all SARMs are actually going to blatantly suppress all of these hormones in a dose dependent manner. It's just about reaching that threshold for that patient in the clinical context and their, you know, specific endocrine system and their you know individual propensity to things but i think at any dosage it's going to affect someone in a similar way regardless of what you know inconsistencies the data is showing in these clinical trials um the process of recovering to baseline healthy endocrine function would be hindered to a far greater extent in steroid users though which seems to be represented in the data as well at least anecdotally as well as you know with the limited data we have in the human trials and kind of trying to uh gauge it against what was used in clinical trials for therapeutic anabolic steroid dosages in the same potential applications for degenerative disease you know attenuating muscle loss, etc. Elevated estrogen or decreased estrogen. So Austrian doesn't aromatize into estrogen directly. However, via the suppression of natural testosterone levels, it creates, it can create an unfavorable balance between testosterone and estrogen in the body. In addition, by occupying the androgen receptor with such a high affinity, Austrian can actually divert a significant amount of testosterone to aromatize into estrogen that wouldn't have otherwise. This in turn can create an elevation of estrogen levels in the body, which is commonly mistaken as a SARM being laced with pro-hormones or being an anabolic steroid. And a lot of times it's just not understanding the mechanism of action of what's going on in the body. While Austrian can cause an elevation of estrogen via the increased aromatization of circulating endogenous testosterone, long-term use or high dosages of Austrian can cause an opposite effect where the body has such a low level of circulating test via endocrine suppression that you no longer have enough aromatization occurring in the body leading to an array of health problems derived from lack of estrogen rather than too high or out of balance test to estrogen ratio. There's a need for a certain amount of estrogen to fulfill certain physiological functions and I can see the long-term use of Austrian in a clinical setting being limited by this specific factor, especially for, well, for both men and women, but this is where the use of exogenous, you know, estrogen would then come into play. But do I really think that, you know, ah, caregivers are going to, you know, get that deep into this, even if this drug ever makes it, even if this compound ever makes it to be approved? Like, I don't know, like, to be honest, I don't know if this women can't even get, you know, androgen replacement if needed, if they're deficient in menopause. So I don't really see um, SARMs for at least several decades being, you know, evaluated in a context like this. I thought it was worth noting because that's basically what's going to happen in the body if these compounds get approved and are used, you know, long term. Applications in alternative hormone replacement therapy in men. This is just an avenue I wanted to explore as it's... Uh, Interesting topic, often brought up, and a lot of uh, ambiguity around it. Um, Austrian doesn't aromatize an estrogen, like I mentioned, which, like I sort of briefly just touched on, kind of disqualifies it as a viable form of standalone hormone replacement therapy in men. A lot of basic physiological functions in men rely on the aromatization of testosterone into estrogen, and 
Low estrogen side effects can be just as harmful to one's health as high ones. In hypothetical long-term HRT applications, Austrian would likely need to be used in conjunction with exogenous estrogen to maintain blood serum concentrations to fulfill physiological functions that would otherwise be dependent on the body's endogenous aromatization of testosterone and estrogen, which is no longer occurring in sufficient amounts. Androgenic activity in the body. Austrian has a dose-dependent increase in androgen activity in the body. So it's extremely selective for muscle and bone relative to androgen-affected tissues, yes. Um, but all SARMs, Austrian included, display a systemic increase in androgen activity. Hence, there is still potential for androgen-related side effects. It's just to a far lesser extent than traditional anabolic androgenic steroid. The ratio of anabolic to androgenic activity is favorable enough whereby the therapeutic dose necessary to yield the desired level of muscle retention and bone mass in a musculoskeletal degenerative disease context would ideally not be high enough where any notable energetic activity could take place, that the SARM would still be generally well tolerated with a great safety profile. And, you know, establishing the balance between all of these factors is the reason why no SARM has yet been approved for human use. And it's, you know, it's very difficult to develop a compound with a substantial amount of anabolic activity with near a near complete absence of androgenic activity. That's kind of the limitation of, you know, why SARMs aren't all, you know, approved already. Um, as well as just lack of data. Interestingly enough, there's actually a lot more data on some of these SARMs than there are on some of the anabolics that guys are slamming themselves in 10 times the dosages meant for the cows they were created for, but <laughs> that's kind of getting off track here. Hair loss. All androgens cause hair follicle miniaturization. The extent to which they do this is dependent on their individual selectivity, binding affinity, and the dosage used. In general, Austrian doesn't seem to cause any notable androgenic alopecia. However, this does not exclude temporary shedding, which I've done a video on, which you should check out if you haven't already, because any hormone fluctuation can cause a shed, and this is not to be confused with androgenic alopecia, but it's still hair loss nonetheless. So all but temporary, it's worth, you know, understanding how that works, and it can occur. Liver toxicity, another commonly misinterpreted uh, thing about SARMs, short-lived increases in ALT to above the upper limit of normal were observed in eight subjects in one of Austrian's clinical trials. The ALT observations in seven of eight subjects had resolved while still continuing their daily dosage and no subject had clinically significant abnormal levels of ALT or AST at the end of the study. So one subject was discontinued due to an elevation in ALT 4.2 times the upper limit of normal. The ALT in that subject returned to normal after discontinuation of the Austrian, and this was with dosages of no higher than three milligrams per day. It's only logical to assume that common recreational dosages of Austrian, which are upwards of, you know, like 20 to 25 milligrams, will likely exhibit some level of liver enzyme elevation. And this is contradictory to common bro science theories that assert that there is zero chance of liver toxicity from SARMs at any dosage amount or that an increase in ALT in their blood work must mean that they have, you know, methylated pro hormones in their SARMs or something. At therapeutic dosages, there appears to be a low risk profile, but it should be noted that there may be some notable degree of liver toxicity at dosages commonly used for recreational performance enhancement, which would likely resolve itself after cycling off but you know a common misconception is that SARMs are you know have no liver toxicity and that's just not the case lack of aromatization and 5 alpha reduction Austrian does not aromatize and uh, more importantly the lack of aromatization limits potential side effects that could occur from aromatization from traditional anabolic steroids like testosterone it does not undergo 5-alpha reduction either, which is speculated to contribute to its sparing effect on the prostate and other androgen-related tissues. I don't believe this is the case whatsoever based on my own research, and the reason for that is there are several androgens that do not undergo conversion to a more androgenic compound when they hit 5-alpha reductase, and one of the most notable being Ment or Trestolone. If you haven't seen my video on Ment, I highly advise you check that out. Trenbolone is another one. Um, 
Some androgens are actually more androgenic prior to 5-alpha reduction and present an increase in androgenic side effects in androgenic side effects when they're inhibited with 5-alpha reductase inhibitors like finasteride and dutasteride. An example of this is nandrolone. Um, if somebody you know, was taking nandrolone and in conjunction with finasteride and dutasteride and was inhibiting its 5-alpha reduction into dihydronandrolone, which is its less androgenic metabolite, they would actually be increasing androgenicity in the body as opposed to reducing it with the 5-AR inhibitor. So Austrian is inherently selective for the AR. It's not, um, it's selectivity for muscle and bone tissue relative to androgen affected tissues in the prostate is not a result of its inability to be altered by 5-alpha reductase, at least in my opinion. So in conclusion, um, Austrian, uh, while it's one of the closest arms to being approved in a clinical setting um i still think it has a way to go i honestly don't think it's the most ideal sarm for its uh potential therapeutic uses i think there are sarms that present um benefits or just are more efficacious milligram for milligram remains to be seen if it's going to make it through but i just wanted to make a video elaborating on clarifying a lot of ambiguity about it um you know, clearing up some misconceptions and, you know, misguided opinions on it based on bro science and whatnot. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Please like subscribe, check out my blog, moreplatesmoredates.com. I have a lot of the clinical studies linked there if you wanted to check them out. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.